And you saying that 242 pounds, you don't want to add water weight. Is that what you're saying? I guess so, but if it's the same amount of calories, then I guess it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Doesn't really matter from that perspective. But a couple of questions back, we calculated what the fluid uh, needs are for the patient. And then we also said that as far as nutrition is concerned, our maximum amount we're going to use is two liters. So we've already calculated, I think, 800 or something for one of the solutions. Uh, was the other one like 500 or something? Can't remember. How much was it? 300, yeah, 3, 314 or something like that. So we have about 1,100, a little bit over 1,100 now. We don't have much more volume left. Um, so if you were choosing, I gave you everything here, but if you were choosing which solution you were going to use, choosing the 10% is probably you know going to give you too much, too much volume. So that's why you can use the 20%. So in most cases, we do use 10%, um, but obviously, for this particular formulation, 10% will give me too much volume. All right, okay. These next two slides are really, again, some of this stuff is just for information only. I know we're doing the calculations part, but I do want you to understand it because it's not always just given uh, to you. I think, if I remember correctly, I think you had a discussion already over fluids and electrolytes, right? It's a fine discussion. <laughs> discussion. We're having a discussion right now. No, then no, we didn't. Uh, you already had a discussion about this? No. No? No. We got a handout. Here you go, this is yours. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Well, uh, you've been introduced to some of this information. Okay. So our major electrolytes that we're gonna uh, talk about, I'll go through in the next two slides. Uh, but sodium, of course, is one of them. When we're talking about um, how, you know, again, everything that I'm gonna be giving you is real life <coughs> things. So we're really only talking about three uh, types of salts. If you'll notice, it's gonna be the same thing for potassium. It's either gonna be a chloride salt, an acetate salt, or a phosphate salt. Okay, that's all we, well, let me stop for a second. For TPN, those are the three salt forms that we use, okay? There's only really only one other salt form that we use. Anybody know? For sodium? Nobody knows? Who wanna give me a guess? No guesses either? I said I listed three here. There's technically a fourth salt form that we use. We just don't use it in parenteral nutrition. So magnesium chloride. Sodium bicarb. Right. So sodium bicarb is also used, but we don't use that for uh, parenteral nutrition. So technically could use a sodium bicarbonate, and you'll see that used as well, but for the for parental nutrition. All right, so these are the three that we use, um, and these are standard uh, units. So, I mean, I could change the unit just for the math purposes, but it's not real. For the most part, the any chloride salt, sodium chloride salt is gonna be four milli equivalents per meal, an acetate salt is gonna be two milli equivalents per Meal. And of course, phosphate. And, and I don't know why students struggle with that, but phosphate salt, all salt forms are going to give you both, right? They're going to give you sodium and they're going to give you chloride. Sodium and acetate. And here's sodium and phosphate. The only difference is when we're looking um, at a patient's profile, uh, lab values, etc. We have to monitor both their phosphate and their potassium. So we need to make sure that we're aware of both components. For the most part, we're not monitoring how much chloride or how much acetate someone's getting. We do somewhat. Anybody know 
what we look at, do we look at chloride or acetate to get an acetate level? Or we look at their uh, chloride level? What do you think we look at? Mm. Yeah, we're going to monitor. But if, if we think we're giving them too much chloride, what am I looking at? Anybody know? You're going to look at their pH. So this is going to be more acid. This is going to be more basic. So if we have uh, arterial blood gas and their pH, their blood pH is too high, right? We can use chloride salts. So it's going to make it, it's going to take it down. If it's the other way around, if it's too acidic, and we don't need to give them too much chloride salt, then we'll switch that to an acetate salt. Okay? Um, so, but when we're looking at their blood electrolytes, we will look at the amount of phosphorus they have in their blood, as well as the amount of potassium. So we, we will be manipulating that. As a result, if I gave the only time I'm given sodium phosphate is or sodium or potassium, as you can see it's the same salt. Sodium or potassium phosphate is when, um, oh, I got a typo here. This is of sodium and this is of potassium. This is of sodium. So I'll fix that. But the only time I'm going to use a phosphate salt is when I want to replenish phosphorus and either sodium or potassium. So does that make sense? If their phosphorus is normal, I don't need to use a phosphate salt. So sometimes students say, well, how do I know which one to pick in between the sodium or the potassium? Well, it's the same rationale. If, if your sodium is normal, then I don't need to pick the sodium phosphate if I'm trying to replenish phosphate and um, another electrolyte if my potassium is the one that's low, I'm doing potassium and phosphate. If my sodium is the one that's low, I'm doing sodium. If both of them are low, I'm getting low. Right? We're also going to give calcium, which comes in the chloride and the gluconate. The one that we use most is gluconate. In an emergency situation, we'll use chloride. Um, as you can see, there's more calcium that's available in chloride than in gluconate, but the chloride uh, is more of a irritant. So you know you can really harm patients by giving them um, calcium chloride. Uh, so that's why we only use it in an emergency, and we're going to only give it in central line for a large blood vessel. But for the most part, we're going to do gluconate. And as mentioned earlier, magnesium is also something that we use, but the only magnesium uh, IV that you're going to use is going to be the sulfate. All right? So these will be, I provide the standards for you. You don't have to memorize them, no. The, it'll be in the problem. It'll always be in the problem, even on Netflix. But uh, I provide them for you so that you can do the math however you want to, just keep coming back. These will always be the um, standardized concentration that'll be given. Um, we also know, you talked about this before, uh, an issue with calcium and phosphate as far as solubility is concerned. These two bind together. Um, do we ever use that knowledge clinically? Calcium and phosphate binding together? I see some, huh? Huh? You, you would think so. I, okay, that's a bit. Okay. When do you think we would do? When you're mixing with the TPN. Okay, when you're mixing for this purpose, yeah, when you're mixing a TPN. The order that you put it in, it may bind it. Okay. Any any other time that we use that knowledge outside of nutrition? Huh? When we do what? Um, 
about that. When do you use that? When there is an increase in, in cluster in the body. Mm -hmm. You're going to give them calcium? Give them calcium. You do? You said, I thought so. Uh, yeah, so you use um, phosphate binders when people have hyperphosphatemia. Yes. One of the phosphate binders that we utilize is uh, calcium acetate. Brand name Phoslo. It's telling you right there, we use calcium to lower the uh, phosphorus. Um, so yes, we use calcium as a phosphate binder uh, for Typically, people with end stage renal disease that you have a chance of, and, and for the most part, they're going to be on dialysis. So their phosphate levels will, will get pretty high. So we even use that clinically. But for this purpose, again, we're talking about uh, precipitation. They bind together, uh, and we want to prevent that. Um, so, as this says, one of the reasons why we use calcium gluconate is because it's It'll lower that risk of precipitation. Order is important. We want to add the phosphate first. Um, and then also, we do some other things to um, make sure that the risk of uh, precipitation is lower. So make sure that the pH is lower. Remember what we talked about as far as that? So kind of how we pick uh, which soft forms we're going to use and also putting it in the refrigerator for help precipitation. One of the things that's not mentioned here, um, again, this is just you know for your information. Some institutions do not mix the lipid with the other components. They give it separately. And the reason for that is because once you put the uh, lipid in, the lipid is white, you know, it makes it real milky, you can't really see anything. So if you do have precipitation, you won't know. Because you can't see uh, what's, what's in it. So some institutions don't do that because once you put the lipid in there, if there is precipitation, you won't know about it. Uh, but, like I said, it's still commonly done as far as adding lipids to the bag. All right, so we talked about this one. This one is asking, uh, this is saying that you, you want 150 mil equivalents of sodium, but you're giving it two different salt forms, so you want half of it. Sodium chloride, half of the sodium acetate. How many mils of each will you need? So what did you come up with? 19. Okay. Okay, all right. numbers in here, but of course, like we said, round to the nearest whole number. As we mentioned, this would be 19, and this will be 38, right? Okay. I will say, <clears throat> go back to the, the, I think the next one I ask about, yeah, I do ask about this. I will say, for the most part, yeah, it doesn't really matter. On this kind of question, order does not matter, right? Order doesn't matter. We're giving an equal amount. Here, you just divide it by half. I'm giving 75 here, I'm giving 75. It doesn't matter if I started with the chloride or if I started with the acetate. As long as I use the right conversion unit, the answer will be the same. When you're doing uh, phosphate, though, you always want to start with the, the phosphate component. Or you're gonna get it wrong. So what what answers did we get for this one? How much potassium phosphate? How much potassium chloride? Seven mils of phosphate. Uh oh, I heard two different things. I heard fourteen point six. Round to the mirror solar. Okay, so for this one, I said start with the phosphate first. Do you know why you start with the phosphate first? 
because it contains potassium. It's both of them, so it's contributing. Phosphate is the only one that's giving you your full phosphate load, okay? And it has potassium in it. So if our total amount of potassium is 60, and this one is contributing both, I need to know how much is contributing because the other salt is only giving the rest of it, not 60, and it's giving no phosphate. So you already know my target here is 21. So if my target is 21, and this is the only one that's gonna do it, well, how much do I need to hit that target? If I gave them seven mLs, I'll hit that target of 21. However, I did give half of the potassium with just that one. So now all I need is the other half. So set up the ratio, and then that'll tell me it's 15, okay? And as was mentioned before, if you calculated 14.6 and round it to the nearest whole number, wouldn't it still be 15? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any questions about that? So, if I switched up this question and, and it was sodium phosphate instead of potassium, which one would you do first? The phosphate, right? other salt is both salt, sodium and phosphate. So if I'm replenishing sodium and I'm replenishing phosphate, I need to know how much sodium I'm given through that formulation because the other formulation is only doing the sodium or the potassium. If you do it the other way, let's say you do in this particular I, you know, so I don't want to, I'm kind of laughing because this comes up. In this particular practice problem that I gave you, let's say you said, get you that case. I did it another way, I got the same answer, so I'm gonna keep my way. Fine. The only reason why you got the same answer is only because, just because in this problem, I did 60 milli equivalent and the 21 millimoles gave you half of it. So even if you did it the other way and say, I can get half one, half the other, you would have come up with seven and 15. You would have. So you would have done the wrong method and got the right answer. But that's not very reliable. All I have to do is change the amount of potassium and immediately your answer is gonna be wrong. You say, I did the same thing. Yeah. But you didn't do what I told you to do. So in real life, you're gonna do the phosphate first. I don't care what your target is, you're gonna do that and that'll always tell you how much of the other one you'll do. All right, so this one is the same thing we just set up. We just use uh, the concentration, you should have come up with 22. Did anyone come up with anything different? 21.7, that's what you came up with? And, and then what? You didn't round it to the nearest whole number? You wanted to do it your way. <laughs> nah, I ain't it to the nearest whole number. You came up with 21.7. Yeah, how? Try it again, let me see. 10, 10 divided by 0.465. Then come up with 21.5, something, 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 something. Oh, yeah. mm. It would have still given you the same answer, which is okay. Unless I said round it to the nearest 10. Then, all right, and the last one, same method, but just doing it with magnesium. Oh, should have come up with four emails. All right. So, those are pretty straightforward, right? Mm -hmm. 
why is the previous one not the same? Is this one? I don't think your target was the same. You saying why was it not four MLs? For magnesium? For calcium. Okay. All right. So the target was 10, and the concentration was 0.465. So if you set it up here, it's going to be 10 divided by 0.465. All right? So 5 wouldn't get you there. tell you guys, um, I like math, I like numbers, so sometimes I find enjoyment in some of these things, but more than anything, I like real simple. So whenever I look at especially numbers like this, even before I put it in the calculator, I know what my general number needs to be. And if I want to know how many times will this go into 10, couldn't I move this decimal one place over? And that'll tell me 10, right? But I know I haven't reached it. So if I use 10 mLs of something that's 4, 0.465, I would have 4.65 milliequivalents. Y'all with me? You see what I'm saying? I did 10 mLs. So then that means if I did 20, it'll be double that. 4.65 is 9 point something. I mean, 4.5 and 4.5 is 9. So 4.65 and 4.65 gotta be 9 point something, right? So if I had 20 mLs, it's still not going some. I'm still not there so, yet. So I know that that has to be 20 something, right? I know it has to be 20 something. So I still put it in my calculator, but while I'm using numbers like this, it'll, and you can do that same thing with any of them. Same way here, right? If I gave you a question and I said, hey, what's 16 divided by four? Y'all wouldn't even pull out your calculator. But if I put it up like this, you <laughs> Right? All right. So any questions about any of this? As I mentioned before, I'm gonna go back uh, real quick. I want to state this one more time because I don't want nobody meeting me in my office. <laughs> you know, later on, getting mad at me and whatnot. Because I know I'm going to say something slick. All right, so I'm, gonna, I don't, I'm not worrying about the, the uh, answers. I'm just going back to the questions. So, I mentioned here, what could I do? So, what I could do is, I asked you for the, I think I'm going to three. I'm going to some more. Okay, yeah. So here, we started out with one of the drugs, right? And I asked you for the loading dose, but we're obviously given a loading dose and a continuous infusion. So right there on that one problem, there are really two practice problems. I just asked you one of them. So you think you can go back and do the question I didn't ask you? Yes. Okay. I would suggest that you do. Huh? The other thing that I said is that for the most part, there are two strategies that we do when we're making IVs. One strategy is we just add the drug to whatever the diluent volume is, right? which is what we did in this scenario, or we take out whatever diluent volume we're adding so that the final volume is a fixed volume, which is what we did on practice problem number two. Could you do that on this one? That's four questions right there. Turn one question into four, that's all I can do. I can change the numbers as well. 
<laughs> I'm giving you all my tricks. I'm giving you all the only tricks I can do. So that's the only difference between problem number one and number two. I just gave you two different scenarios, because I told you there's two different ways that we can do it. So however way that these IVs are made will determine how you would calculate the rate, whether that's for the low dose or for the infusion. So I just gave you two problems and gave you both scenarios. That's all I can do, right? How could I change this one? Oh no, that's it's the same thing. But this one, I think I asked you both questions. Number two. No, no, I didn't. Okay, I asked you both questions for the first drug. And on this one, I just asked you one question for the first, for the second drug, which was just a continuous infusion. But I could have done the same thing for the low notes, right? But I didn't ask you that. So, like I said, practice on the ones that I didn't ask you. Um, on here, well, that's pretty straightforward of dispensing a 24 hour supply. But some of you wanted to dispense the whole amount, the two day amount. I mean, I, I could technically ask that. But everything else is pretty much the same. Um, on this one, what can I do? Well, we kind of did it in class. We said this particular patient was an obese patient. So if they were obese, that means that we needed to use the uh, adjusted body weight. But did not give you one that was not obese, right? Can I give you one that had a lower body weight than normal? That's all I can do, right? And that would determine which weight that you would use. Okay. Oh, what else could I do? From a cranial clearance standpoint. Huh? I can make mail, so we said that that's going to be important. I talked about that. Would the formula change? Yes. The formula would change not only for creatinine clearance, but it'll also change for adjusted body weight, right? Mm -hmm. I'm giving y'all all the tricks. <clears throat> On here, I think the next one we did weight based dosing. I made mean, this one straightforward and easy. Mm -hmm. I told you to just use the total body weight. But what if I didn't tell you to use the total body weight? You'd have to fig you'd have to figure it out. Don't say I've used the adjusted. In this particular patient, yes, we use the adjusted. But you would have to figure out which weight to use, right? But the process would still be the same. Okay? All right, so I did um, the same thing here, just another flow rate. There was no different in your flow rate calculation than, um, than anything else. Again, the only other thing that I could do is change these numbers. Because this is the standard concentration for this hospital, but maybe we'll go to another hospital. Oh, I mean, I could also change the units as well, right? Uh, I think here we did, we did microgram per kilo per minute that we converted to meals per hour, uh, but we could get different units. So that could, that could uh, be changed as well. And I didn't mention it on the other one, but units can also change. So we gave that for grams, but what if I gave it a milligram? And asked you for grams, or gave you a gram and asked you for milligram. Didn't I do that? The process is still the same. Yes? What do you mean, what's the standard? So if you pulled a bag of, uh, just like with short here, if you pulled a bag of norepinephrine, all right, leave it there. It's going to tell you it has eight milligrams. One type, eight milligrams and two kilograms. 
but we dose it by micrograms per kilo per minute. So, do I have micrograms on here as well? Yeah. You pull out a bag and tell you how much micrograms are in it, how many milligrams. So, you can change the unit. But I'm not going to tell you how many kilograms. Kilograms is not on there. That doesn't make sense. So, yeah. We could, we could adjust the, uh, I'm not even putting nanogram. I could, but. No, no. Huh? No. I, mean, I could, I'm saying I could. You could, you could technically do all that, but I'm not gonna do all that because that's not, that's not realistic of what's being done. Okay, so same thing here. We use BMI. Only thing that could be different would be the units, and I gave you both calculations based on unit. The gender could change, you know, but as far as how to do the problem, how to set it up, how to interpret it, it's the same, right? All right, <clears throat> so we talked about that, so it's the same kind of thing. What could be different? In here, we, I gave you, not really this, this is pretty straightforward. But in here, what could change? We said we could change the percentage here. I could change the target, of course. I could change whatever weight you use. I asked for meals, and I gave you the amount. Couldn't I give you the meals and ask you for the amount? But the setting up the problem will be the same. I could change the rounding, right? So again, go back, look at the practice problems, look at how many different ways I can ask you the same problem. And you're gonna have a lot of practice problems to do. Then you get the test, you're like, easy, I already did it this way. But if you don't, could get with the, you know, the time limit and everything, stress, it could, it could stress you out. I talked about this one already, kilocals, mills, or mills, kilocals, or changing the percentage. That's all we can do. Here, all we can do is change the salts and the targets. Whatever my target is, whatever my distribution of each. Otherwise, it's gonna be the same. Or, I asked you for the number of mills to reach this target. I gave you the number of mills and asked you what the total amount would be the same process, right? So really it's, only thing that can change are the numbers and what I'm asking you of the number. Okay, that's it. And each of these electrolytes will be the same, the same thing. You're setting up your ratio of proportion or using dimensional analysis to come up with whatever that total amount is. The only curveball that I told you was what? As far as order doesn't matter on any of them, with the exception of phosphate, right? And on that one, you want to do the phosphate first. Sound like everybody's going to make 100 to me. <coughs> any questions? How many Comments, Miss Can we go forward? Huh? How many questions on plantation are you giving us? Good question. I don't know. I did. It's not gonna be sixteen. It's not gonna be sixteen. So it's definitely more practice problems than what they're gonna give me on the test. But I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think eight. You gonna get more? You gonna get more than eight? Yeah. Oh, that's. You think they're going to be sweeter than me today? He give me more than me? He give me more than me? Okay. All right. How much he going to give me? 20? Man. Oh, you must be 15. Can we do it? That's going to be up to Dr. Bobo. He hasn't told me how many I have yet. Two lectures is 20 some questions? Yeah, last exam, Dr. Bobo told me Twice. <laughs> I just told you you have 40 plus practice questions right here. 
You got my list at 20? Okay. You have 40 plus preference questions right here. All right. So let, let me go ahead and skip to the other uh, part that I want to kind of talk about real quick. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, here, I've taken out a lot of stuff since we needed more time on the calculation part, but I think this is the part that's uh, the most important anyway. And I'll talk about a few things uh, in it as well. But, you know, of course, just as review, all this is review, right? We're looking at absorption, distribution, what else? Metabolism and elimination or excretion, right? So all of those things, I just gave you the answer. I didn't ask you a question. All of them can be um, affected in gastrointestinal disorders or diseases, right? When we look at absorption, the major pharmacokinetic factor we're looking at is bioavailability, right? Um, when we're looking at Distribution, the major pharmacokinetic factor we're looking at is volume of distribution. Now, what I can tell you is, is bioavailability impacted in a GI disorder? What do you think? Yeah. Could it be? Yeah. If so, how? Ooh. You were confident that, yes, it could be. Because sometimes when you first get that oral, you know, first of all, it breaks down in the body, so through the intestine, so if there's a blockage there, how else would it be able to distribute from the intestine? Okay, you told me a lot of stuff in there. You skipped some stuff too, but I understand what you're saying. So, the, the, for most drugs, absorption happens in the GI tract, right? So, if the GI tract is not functioning properly, absorption will be. Uh, alter. Yeah. It'll either be increased or decreased. Right? Another thing is that absorption is also based on the chemical properties of the drug, right? Mm -hmm. So if a drug is uh, absorbs well in an acidic environment and I don't have an acidic environment in my stomach anymore, yeah. would it impact absorption? Yes. yes. Right? So it will impact absorption. So again, absorption, we know, if you just think about it, it will be impacted. So that means that the pharmacokinetics of the drug will be affected. Distribution. How would distribution change? Or how can it change? If your albumin levels are low? Okay. Okay, why would your albumin level be low and why would you have a side? So liver dysfunction, right? All right. Okay, absolutely. So you talked about liver dysfunction um, in this course. So yeah, your vitamin distribution can be impacted as well. Um, why did you mention albumin though? You got me confused. You said your albumin is low. Don't it, um, binding. Binding. Oh, oh, protein binding? Yes. Yeah. So drugs that are highly protein binding. Yeah. And you're not making much protein. <laughs> Distribution is going to be affected, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. <clears throat> so we talked about increased or decreased gastric secretion. We talked about hypoalbuminemia for yeah, those drugs that are highly protein bound. Mm -hmm. If the drug isn't highly protein bound, who cares, right? Mm -hmm. But for those that are highly protein bound, it does matter. Um, so your two major disease factors really are essentially GI disease and cardiovascular. Those are the two major disease groups that uh, alter absorption and distribution. So we want to talk about the cardiovascular one. Uh, but we, we can talk about the GI. The only thing that I would say is that, because you know, we're, we're focusing on, on uh, GI disorders in this particular uh, course, but the patients just have one thing. No, not normally, you know, not normally. They normally have multiple things. And as was mentioned here earlier, depending on the, the uh, nature of the GI dysfunction, once you start having 
hepatic dysfunction. You're going to have renal dysfunction. I know that y'all talked about hepatorenal syndrome, should have at least, but you're going to start having uh, renal dysfunction. And if someone has cardiac dysfunction, especially in the area of heart failure, you're already having a volume issue to begin with. Mm -hmm. So if I'm having a pumping volume issue mm -hmm. and I'm having an elimination volume issue, what does that volume distribution look like? Mm -hmm. Very poor. Very poor. Mm -hmm. Very high. I have volume everywhere. Yeah, it's not coming out. It's not coming out. <laughs> so my volume is staying in. Mm -hmm. And if that drug is highly water soluble, that drug is going everywhere in my body because I'm full of bosses. Okay? <clears throat> so that's where other comorbid conditions could uh, come into play, right? Um, now also, blood flow, depending on what our uh, condition is. Oh, I'll put it here on this other one about uh, metabolism and elimination. Blood flow to the liver or the kidney. Uh, if blood flow is the reason for the dysfunction, then you're going to have uh, issues there as well. All right. So of course, as was mentioned, liver dysfunction is a problem in distribution when you're talking about plasma protein. What else? Is that the only area that liver dysfunction is a problem? Well, hint, hint. I put it on the metabolism slide. It's the major organ for metabolism, right? So if it's not working, how much metabolism are you getting? Mm -hmm. And if this drug needs to be metabolized, meaning that it has an active metabolite mm -hmm. that is not being converted to, then the uh, efficacy of that drug is going down, right? Mm -hmm. As I mentioned before, in renal depending on the extent of the hepatic dysfunction, you're going to start having uh, renal dysfunction as well. Uh, so again, metabolism and, metabolism at minimum, if you have liver dysfunction is affected, right? But for uh, um, agents that are renally eliminated, elimination is not an issue unless they have kidney dysfunction. But some drugs are not renally eliminated, so in those you would uh, have an issue. I just want to mention these, and I think I've mentioned these before, so I think you probably have seen this before, but because you're saying this has nothing to do with GI, well, they work together. Because remember, our patient, and I'm going to pull up our patient next, our patient does have GI disorders. I didn't mention them last time, but I so I'll mention them now. But they have GI disorders, right? But we also mentioned that the patient was in an ICU. So this is a critically ill patient. So this is GI disorders on top of their distressed condition, highly distressed condition. On top of, this was also an obese patient, right? So there, this says increased volume of distribution, but this is talking about liquid volume. Because in these patients, you're going to have more liquid volume, essentially. But if it's a highly protein-bound uh, uh, drug, and their dysfunction is liver dysfunction, then it's not going to necessarily increase volume of distribution right now. Um, protein binding uh, changes, clearance uh, changes their state. All right, so we went back here. We just went through it, um, but I didn't mention it, like I said. So this person had esophageal varices. They had, uh, as a result, well, I think you probably have talked about esophageal varices being something that you're worried about in someone with alcoholic cirrhosis. So they had alcoholic cirrhosis and is now having esophageal varices, which is a, uh, that's going to be a tough situation. This patient, as presented, is going to always go uh, into the ICU. So what does this mean? Child 
few classifications. It's showing you how severe their liver dysfunction is, right? Yeah. Which means for us, in the pharmacokinetics way, it's going to tell you how well, if this is a drug which most drugs are metabolized in the liver, how much metabolism you're going to get. Okay? So, not much, you know, when we look at it from, from this regard. Um, some other things that I wanted to kind of highlight. We ran out. Oh man, I moved it on accident. Your serum creatinine, for at least now, we, we, when we calculated it, we saw that it bumped up. So now back down to a lower number, but that's still uh, higher than normal. So there are still some real issues that we're talking about. Why is the high and high? Or is the high?
as soon as you take it, it's going to start expanding in your stomach, continue all the way through your GI tract, going home. Okay? So it's not metabolized, it's not distributed anywhere, and it's not absorbed. It's just when you swallow it, it's working its way out. So what does that mean, though? What about other drugs that you might give? What's going to happen to them? It's going to block all that. So it's not being absorbed either. So you typically space out medications from that. In this particular patient, could we stop it or keep it? We can keep it, right? She's having liver dysfunction and kidney dysfunction, but it doesn't really matter. That drug is still safe. What about omeprazole? Stop it? You want to increase the dose? Decrease the dose? What are you talking about? The metabolite? I mean, metabolite? Mm -hmm. What does that mean, though? What does the uh, enzyme family have to do with her liver dysfunction? But I thought you wanted to stay away from pretty much like phase one. You prefer phase two because of the function. So what? She's not in renal failure or nothing. Can you reduce that? What, what are your options that meet that criteria? All of them are um, metabolized. Yeah, all PPIs on 2C19 and 3A4. So you're not really changing that strategy, you know, on that. So you do have a potential here for drug drug reaction. The only thing that I would see is that this is a highly uh, plasma protein bound drug, right? Mm -hmm. And if you don't have much protein, right? So this could be an issue. This could turn out to be an issue for you. All right, huh? What about the next one? So what are we going to do? We're going to keep it in the space that's higher decreases. Or we reduce the amount. You want to reduce the amount? Or should we change it to H2? I did. I did. So you can change it to H2. Is it do daily? Or just one time? I'll do What's the safer alternative? You think I should use safer? I gotta see. I gotta see how you do um, this setup up with H two. Okay. What about? You can get the I think you have more drilling actually. All right, what about Bumix? What do you think? It's highly protein bound as well. It's highly protein bound as well. It's highly I'm only pointing things out. That doesn't mean that you have to make an adjustment for it. What does she take his firm electron for? Yeah, it's 
What about for criminal law? That's prevention. That's for prevention. But a very small difference. So we can leave them. Should be 20? So you saying I'm going to keep that option? Or should it be just as 20? So, what I want you to do. Um, if you were doing a medication reconciliation, I gave you this case. What are you gonna do? I'll remove the lock to me. You gonna just start moving stuff? Change? Yeah, exactly. You gonna probably look it up and make it yeah, like a Let's see how make sure it's the therapy. Okay. <laughs> so, so I just I just gave you a framework. <laughs> And let me know, or, or you know, what you would stop or keep. Now, I only gave those three options because I was running out of room. There is a third option of change, right? But in order to change something, you have to stop it, right? So you may stop one and say, I will replace it with something else. And that's that's fine, too, if the patient uh, still needs something. Why do you do something? Something? So what? They're not on for roast mom. And so we can add it. Oh, but you need to substitute it for the same. You can't just add it. You have to substitute it for the um, yeah. other. Yeah. We can use it to instead of the remove the Buddha and put like I'm hearing some things, but I'm scared too. What? What? <laughs> Make sure, <laughs> make sure you know if you're gonna stop or keep the ones that she's on. Yeah. Okay. Because you're saying I'm gonna add this. Okay. And you're gonna and you stop. might add it, but then if I'm gonna still keep this, no. then no, now you're gonna, you're gonna have problems. So, so that's why I said there is really a third category change, but they're still telling you if I'm gonna stop or keep one of these. I'm going to either stop it or keep it, and then I'll add something else. Okay? So just go through this, what she's on. Like I said, I gave you the pharmacokinetic framework. Now what you do with that is determine, hey, do I need to make any adjustments to her therapy based on her condition? Okay? All right. The last two, and we're riding out of here. Bioavailability, this one is asking about absolute bioavailability. Remember that absolute bioavailability formula that you take in the AUC of the, uh, the oral times the dose of the IV divided by the AUC of the IV times the dose of the oral. That's the formula. Uh, so you should be able to, with that formula, Calculate the absolute bioavailability because we've given you both doses and both uh, AUC. What did you come up with? 0 0.66. What you did? So. 1.3.1 or 1.3.1? Absolute. Uh huh. What you get? No, it wouldn't be 1. Wouldn't yeah. be 1. Um, 1 means like 100, right? 1 means 100. Yeah. So, what I was about to say is. This is normally a percentage, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not 0.66, oh, so it's 66% percent, okay. percent, right? 
This always comes up. So I'm going to just make it obvious. Do I need to convert this? This is micrograms per mil. This is given in milligrams. Do I need to convert this? Yes. yes. No, you don't. Why? Micrograms per mil and milligrams per liter are the same, right? Uh, yeah. So if you just left it like this, divided 300 by 0.2, your volume of distribution is in what? Liters. Right? Micrograms per mil mm -hmm. and milligrams per liter is the same. So 0.2 milligrams per liter and 0.2 micrograms per mil is the same. So you could convert this, you can cross that out and say 0.2 milligrams per liter, mm -hmm. and that crosses out your milligram, which mm -hmm. means that your volume is yeah. in liters. Okay. The only reason you would need to convert it is if I asked you about the volume distribution in mils. Then you would need to convert it. Because the answer that you would have gotten would have been in liters, then you would convert it to mils, mm -hmm. if, if that's what you need. So, what numbers did you get? Huh? 1,500? 1,500 liters? Okay, let's go back. And it says that normal distribution is 20 to 47 liters per kilo. This patient is what? I think that's 110? 110 kilo? So, 110 times 20 is what? So what happened to the volume of distribution? So, so at minimum, it's 20. At maximum, it's 47 liters per kilo. Normal volume of distribution for that particular drug. So we said at minimum, volume of distribution is normally over 2,000 liters, right? So what happens to the volume of distribution? Decrease. Does it make sense though that it decreased? Because it's 84%. Yeah. 
plasma protein bound, and they have low protein. Right now, it's like she has liver dysfunction. So you would expect for the volume distribution for highly protein bound agents to decrease, right? So we just show mathematically what we were just talking about without crunching the numbers, right? Right? Say it again. Okay. I told you, normal distribution is 20 to 47 liters per kilo, which means that this person, at minimum, if you multiply 20 times 110 kilos, you should have over 2,000 liters per, I mean, 2,000 liters, right? Mm -hmm. And what did you calculate? 1,500, yeah. which means it's less than normal. Oh. I ask you, does that make sense? Yes. yes. Well, you told me earlier something that's highly protein bound. If we don't have protein for it to bind to, it would decrease the volume of distribution. Mm -hmm. Right? So all we did was prove that with the math, but you already knew it was going to be less than that without doing the math. But the math is just confirming what you already suspect, right? Mm -hmm. So as I said, I'm, I gave you a couple of practice problems uh, for that to kind of show you mathematically this is what happens, but we don't necessarily, in real life, go and do the math every time because we already know what it's going to say. We already know highly protein bound, volume distribution is going to decrease in somebody with liver dysfunction because they don't have the um, protein for it to bind to and actively transport. If it's not highly protein bound, it's not using active transport, using passive diffusion as its uh, primary mechanism uh, for distribution. So the amount of protein is not a problem because the protein is not transporting the drug. All right, any questions, comments, concerns? So we just used two, absorption, an absorption example and a distribution example. Um, when we talk about metabolism, your metabolism issue is, again, as I mentioned, one, if there's an active metabolite and we're having a metabolism issue, then the efficacy of the drug is affected. Does it go up or down? Is it improving the efficacy or is it decreasing the efficacy? Decreasing, right? Yeah, so it's not working uh, as effective because now we don't have the active metabolites that are working. But the other issue, I think was some, someone alluded to it uh, as well, is gonna be that of drug-drug interaction, which is the bigger one um, that you'll have when you're having um, <coughs> metabolite uh, issues. And again, for the drug-drug interactions, are we calculating anything? No, oh, you're making adjustments. You know, If that drug interaction is gonna increase one of the drugs, then we have to decrease the dose for that particular drug. So it's not, it's just understanding the concept of that. Elimination, as we mentioned, unless, and, and all of these primary uh, elimination was through the renal system, and unless there was renal dysfunction, we're not, we don't really have an elimination issue. So our primary issues, at least in this particular patient, for most of the drugs that they're on, was in the area of absorption and uh, distribution. Okay. All right. Questions, comments, concerns? It's going to be easy. Easy, eh? You're supposed to say yes. Yes. 
got some practical problems to do. Okay, I got it, but I think it's going to be an easy A. We gave y'all the script. <clears throat> That's all I have. Thank you. Where did you take? The 10th. Oh, wait. Oh, I thought you said December the 10th. What? Oh, man. April the 10th. Okay. Better put that on my calendar. Huh? Give you another assignment? Great. A great assignment. Can I do it?